all extra vegetarian. <laughs> all right, so the red light's on. Red light's on. on. You want me to go yeah. ask if that means they're ready? Or? Good evening and welcome to the May 15, 2017 meeting of the Town Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, can you please take the roll? Mr. Dupree? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. And Ms. Oglis? Thank you. And just for the record, uh, in the absence of Ms. Oglis and Ms. Saunders, um, Ms. Hendrickson and Mr. Dupuri will be voting members this evening. We do have one item that was tabled uh, due to uh, the status of, of the application. That's item number five on the agenda. Hugo Properties, LLC. Next item on the agenda is approval of minutes from the April 24th, 2017 meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Abstain. That's unanimous with one abstention. Thank you. <coughs> The next item, Leighton Farm LLC requests the third amended subdivision plan review for Leighton Farm subdivision, phase one, Elmwood Avenue, assessor's map, R57, lot 1B and 3A. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is an item that actually became, came before uh, our code department, before it wound up to the planning department in terms of um, there was a house built on lot 18 in Leighton Farm and it turned out that upon mortgage inspection, there was a small sort of out, I, I'm not sure if it's a porch or sort of out portion of the building that was built into about two feet into the rear setback. So it was on their property, but we have a 15 foot rear setback. The property had sort of a, a hard angle that it encroached upon. Um, and so the applicants are requesting board approval to modify the lot line adjustment which continues to maintain the 25 foot, uh, required 25 foot setback from the wetland. So it maintains that upland buffer as part of the open space. Um, and that modifies then their rear setback by the necessary two feet to get the structure out of the, um, that setback area on their building envelope. So a uh, fairly small change, fortunate in many ways that the change was able to take place without encroaching upon that 25 foot setback. Um, and so uh, I drafted some brief moment, uh, comments for you, and with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. Uh, does the applicant have anything to add? Come on up. Vincent Mayer, I'm the, I'm the owner of Leighton Farm Subdivision. I uh, just wanted to point out that the, uh, the size of the encroachment the studio, the, the house itself, the foundation, everything, uh, is well within the setbacks. It's the uh, second floor overhang. We didn't realize that we got close to this uh, odd angle of the lot came in. If you have a copy of the plan, but I have them here if you need them. Um, and this uh, part of the home that extends over the boundary is on the second floor, and it's about the size of this podium. It's just the back corner, just the actual corner of the tip of the building that uh, extended over that, that odd property angle. So uh, I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, would you have the opportunity for public comment? Anyone out there? Seeing none. Uh, anyone on the board have any questions or comments on this? Um, one of the comments that the staff did have was the, that recommendation to consider some sort of hardscaping or something along that setback line, given the fact that it is curved, so it may not be intuitive to a, to someone there. Could you speak to that, or whether that's something you might consider? Uh, we do have a few areas in the project that we are required to do that on, ones that are adjacent to sidelines and so forth. But on this particular boundary, 
to several thousand feet that abuts uh, the uh, the wetland, uh, the the upland buffer. That twenty that uh, twenty five foot buffer is many. It's several thousand feet around this whole perimeter, and we don't have that same kind of treatment around the rest of the project. Uh, but what we do have, and of course in every case, is the many uh, property line IN pins that are set by the survey as is shown on that drawing right there. So I think that because it's the same as that throughout the whole project, we'd like to keep it that way if we could, to keep it consistent with all the other places and not just single out this this one backyard to have that uh, hardscape there, if, if that's possible. But we certainly understand it's up to the board and we'll do uh, whatever the board wishes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, I definitely appreciate staff's comment and I I definitely see the logic to it. I, I do um, agree with the, the applicant that given that none of the other parcels has this treatment, um, you know, I, I don't, it's a fairly de minimis change. I don't, don't feel compelled to attach that condition to this particular parcel. Does anyone have any anything contrary to that? Okay, thanks. Um, so with that, again, this is a fairly de minimis uh, amendment, and um, I will make a motion um, that the board approve Leighton Farm LLC's request for the third amended subdivision plan review for Leighton Farm subdivision, phase one, Elmwood Avenue, assessor's map, R57, lot 1B and 3A. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Once again, item number five on the agenda table. <coughs> item number six. Commercial Plates LLC requests a master plan review for Enterprise Business Park Assessor's Map U39. Lot 47-1 through 36. Jay? Uh, sure. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's see, this is an application the board has seen a few times at this point. Um, as you just noted, um, this is before the board for a master plan, which is part of our plan development review process. Just by way of background for the benefit of the board and the public, um, the property is in the Haggis Parkway, and the subject parcel is actually part of a previously approved subdivision going back to the early 2000s, I think it might have been 03 or something, somewhere around that time frame, for what was at that time, or still is I guess I should say, a wholly commercial subdivision. Subsequent to that approval, within the last year to three, the uh, town made some adjustments to the Haggis Parkway zoning, which allows for the incorporation of some amount of residential zoning um, within a commercial development provided that mixture remain at, at a minimum of 60% commercial development and 40, no more than 40% of residential. And that's what the applicant's seeking to do. Um, by way of process, as I said, this is a plan development review process. Requires three distinct and separate phases. The first phase is a site inventory and analysis, which the board conducted, I believe it was last fall or perhaps even late summer. Um, subsequent to that, the next step is a master plan approval. Um, board members may recall this application before you, uh, I believe it was in February, for sort of a, a sketch plan, an intermediate step between site inventory and master plan to really talk about that 40% commercial, 40% uh, residential, 60% commercial split. And, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but I just wanted to provide a little bit of context and again, the purpose of the master plan pro process or phase is to lay out the conceptual um, design and layout for the development. Um, as we noted previous with previous reviews of this, this is a bit of an odd piece to go through the plan development because we have an approved subdivision. We have the, the road alignment pretty well spelled out, the stormwater systems generally spelled out, you know, the, those types of things we typically look at. So in that regard, staff really didn't have much in the way of comment on the overall design concept. But I think, you know, primarily where the focus of the board's attention, of course, board members may have other, uh, other thoughts on it, but staff comments were really around identifying, again, that 60-40 split um, in terms of the use types. Um, 
And so as board members will recall when they're before you, um, they had to make uh, the, the applicant team put together sort of a matrix of a future build-out analysis, if you will, of the remaining commercial lots um, to try to identify how they're going to get to that, again, maintain that 60-40 split. Um, the board had asked for some updates to that, including a floor area, a floor area ratio analysis, and that was been provided. Um, and so that's in your packets for the board to, re to review and sort of consider that build-out. The other thing the board really had a lot of questions on and, um, and staff spent a good amount of time thinking about is really the administrative side of this. Is how do we, um, going forward, since we can't look into a crystal ball to necessarily know exactly how things are going to build out, how can the town ensure, and the applicant for that matter, ensure that this property will maintain conformance with the zoning, the 60-40 split, if you will, or ratio, even if the residential component of this wants to get ahead of the commercial. We had a number of internal conversations. We had a conversation with the town attorney. And really what was identified was, again, given that this board, or the applicant from that matter, doesn't have a crystal ball, can't know for sure what's going to happen, what we have to, what the board's charge is, is to, and the applicants for that matter, is to come up with a build-out analysis that makes sense, that, uh, you know, it, sort of meets the, what we think is a likely market demand. But further still, and really more to the point, what will happen is that the next phase, the subdivision phase, that's when the commercial development component will get codified. Those numbers that are on the build-out analysis will become a condition of the subdivision approval. So that those commercial lots, if you know, commercial lots identified to have just picking numbers, 24,000 square feet of office space on it. That's what we need to come before this board as part of a site plan approval. It's really, it's putting a, a minimum, if you will, on the square footage, commercial square footage on each lot. Could that get adjusted in the future? Yes, but that would require subdivision amendment, again, through a, a, a very comprehensive process by the board. Um, so hopefully that helps sort of put that discussion into focus. I know it, it's pretty nuanced and it's picking up where we were back in February, but I believe all board members were present at that time and um, hopefully I've done enough to also educate some folks in the public as well, but that's what I have for you all right. as a starting point. Thanks. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to the applicant. Good evening. Uh, Andrew Johnson, Atlantic Resource Consultants. Uh, we're representing the applicant on this uh, project. Um, we have had some rather lengthy discussions on this density issue I mean, just for the benefit of, of everybody here you can see the, the layout that we're proposing I'm sure the board is, is relatively familiar with that now the intent of the application is obviously to add a residential component in the same, in the same type of manner as the commercial development has happened on, on this lot already and I think the, the board and, and members of the public who have been up through Enterprise Business Park will recognize that it's a very high quality development. It's a very nice looking and aesthetic development. And the idea here is to add a residential component that is similar in nature to the commercial component that's on the site, make the overall project a little more marketable, add a little more vitality to the development in the region, and, and give us a little bit more of a spread as far as the, the development of the property goes. So we've done the residential density calculations it looks like the, pro the property will yield about 258 residential dwelling units and that's taking a, a full residential dwelling unit. Obviously if they went to, to the smaller two bedroom and one bedroom mix, the unit count would go up um, in accordance with the, uh, with the ratios provided in section 7C, I think it, it is of your ordinance, so you get more units. <coughs> the smaller units count as less than one dwelling unit. But the, the, the primary purpose, again, is to add the residential component off the existing commercial park, integrate those uses, buffer them as necessary, and end up with a uh, high quality and, uh, and highly marketable development. The one thing that I would like to add on the 60-40 split, um, that's something that when we first looked at the zoning, I've got to say it's fairly unusual to have uh, a zoning ordinance that's written that way. They are typically written where 
as, as a black and white standard. So for example, if you did the 60-40 split on land area, that's something that is solid, that doesn't change. You can say, you know, 60% land area commercial, 40% of the land area is residential, and that never changes over time. The way the ordinance is written is clearly not with that intent. It's clearly to have a, a much more flexible application. There are no timelines written into the ordinance, and I'd have to think that was deliberate. It isn't by accident that that happened. And it allows, I say, it allows that flexibility, it allows the board to look at what is a reasonable development scenario, um, look at that on a, on a judgment uh, basis, and decide whether they think it is appropriate, the number of residential versus commercial units that are, are uh, proposed for a lot. That puts a bit of a burden on the board, and I have to say um, there are many places where I don't think this would work very well. I think Scarborough is one of the places where it would work well, because there is, a, a, there is enough, um, I don't want to butter up the board too much, but there's enough of a level of sophistication here to understand what the, what the overall objective is. And I think it, it is very difficult to draw a hard line in the sand and say, at this date you need to meet the 60-40, or even you know, in two years' time or in three years' time you need to meet the 60-40. And there's some very good market reasons for that. And the one of the things we've been very fortunate at, and we've, we've represented a number of different clients across different market sectors, what we typically find when people are asking for site selections is many, and with the possible exception of, of um, national retail chains. Many of our clients ask us not just for a site that is going to accommodate their current needs, but is also going to accommodate their future needs. That's very typical, particularly of higher end businesses like research and development, which is, would definitely be a market sector that would be attracted by enterprise business park. And some of our recent experience on that is that people come in looking for a site where they can build, but also they want potential to expand 50%, sometimes up to 100% on the same site. And there are very good reasons for that, particularly in that R&D sector. Some of those folks are paying north of 300 bucks a square foot for their buildings. So their budgets are fairly tight. One client I, I recently worked with actually ended up in Saco. So they were looking in Scarborough. Um, but they're looking at a building where their budget is fairly tight. We're looking for a site which can accommodate twice that size. So I, I just want the board to bear that in mind because if you go the route of saying this lot has to be built out to 24,000 square feet, for example, if somebody comes in, they want to build 15,000 square feet and then expand at a later date to 24,000 square feet, they're going to look for a site that can accommodate that, but they're not going to come in with 24,000 square feet at the start. And you have to look at somewhat at the consequences of some of these things before you fire ahead and do them. And my concern when I, when I read that proposal was you're going to kind of diminish the marketability of the commercial sites by doing that. And then you end up with the unintended consequence of more vacant commercial sites and then you're stretching even further to get to the 60-40. So you just have to be a little careful about how we approach this and what lines we draw in the sand because I think the intent of the ordinance is for it to be flexible to look at potential expansion, there's certainly potential expansion on the existing lot, and if you look at the density of the existing lots compared to what could be built out, they're very low. I mean, they're underdeveloped, a lot of those sites that are on there now. So I would encourage, um, you know, some further discussion on what the, what the possible ways of uh, mechanisms of getting to that 60-40 split are. But I would also encourage a flexible approach to that, to enable the project to move forward to bring in business, to bring in development to the town, and to let people, let the market decide basically what needs to happen on those lots and what can happen on those lots. I'll leave it at that for now because that's probably enough, <laughs> enough of me saying what I've got to say. But I'd, I'd welcome uh, questions from the board at this point. Thank you. Uh, before we do that, um, anyone like to make public comment on this item? So come up and. Introduce yourself. All right. See any takers? Uh, Nick, would you like to kick us off? Okay. <coughs> I just quick question on the um, grid you have here. Back of the flip. Number thirty. 
Lot 30. That's uh, occupied space, is it? Correct. This is veterinary office. Who that? I'm going to defer to uh, Jason Vassiardis, who's also here. He's a little more familiar with that table. Yes. Uh, yes, Jason Vassiardis, Atlantic Resource Consultants. Yes, that, that's coded wrong. It, it is existing, not proposed. And so my follow-up question on that is, is the numbers and percentages now thrown off? Is that, do you know if that's included or excluded from your percentage analysis here? Well, yeah. well, right, so that actually skews it in our favor because that's much, we're not banging, you know, well, no, no, right. Yeah, so we're, we're not filling that. Right. Is, is it included with the current numbers we see at the bottom or? Yes, because it, it, it's coded by, yeah, when the when it calcs, it actually formatted the calc by color. So, yeah, yeah. So, it, it, it does throw those off a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, that was the first thing. The, and I appreciate your comments. Um, you know, I, I think we've all probably trying to work our, the best solution around here. And the 6040, I'm, I'm sure there was some some logical reason why it was codified that way. Um, I'm not as hard and fast stuck on a 6040. I think that, you know the overall concept here is to make sure that we're using this area largely for commercial, but do allow residential. And that's a that's a recent change. Um, based on what the market was telling us and what the community had for us as feedback and what could make the Hagus Parkway zone a little bit more developable. So, you know, the idea of throwing residential in here, I, I don't personally feel the hard need to make sure you stick to a 60-40. What I don't want to see happen, though, is that for the sake of being able to develop the residential is that we overestimate what realistically could occur here for commercial. And, and I think that's the other part of this piece that we really need to hammer down tonight. And um, I believe the last time you were here, I suggested that we take your current averages and use that to kind of be your gauge. So I saw a span of numbers at the start of your, um, I believe you said you could have between 200 and 22 to 400 and something units potentially in here for residential. Let's see if we can pull it up. Do you, have, do you know what I'm referring yeah, to? Yes. So the so there's there's two calculations. There's the the net residential area calculations, which are your standard for any sort of subdivision, um, mm -hmm. and those are dwelling units and not. Um, so the floor area is irrespective of of the number of actual units. Um, that's just a, a you know you can you can build a bunch of penthouses, I guess, and have 30 units. Um, um, so that so that so we sort of have to meet two sort of standards. One is the net residential area standard and the other is the, the 60-40 calc. Okay. I think it's 248, right? Uh, 250. So what is your anticipated build out as, as your plan is coming for right now? Well, the, so that's a great question and, and this is something I think that we might all be looking at the tree and missing in the forest. We don't actually know what the residential build-out is going to be. There's nothing specific proposed. Um, and certainly there was one discussion with a, with a developer uh, in the past. I think they've even had discussions with town staff. They were, they were looking for a specific number, and that number is actually lower than the numbers that are provided in here. So we basically, we, we look to set the edges, like set the cap, that this would be the, the most residential area you could you could conceivably get based on the fact that if you built the rest of the lots out at what they could from an in, from our professional perspective could be built on each of those lots so the, the interesting thing is someone could come in here with a, a site plan application you know our next step could be we only have 280,000 square feet of residential area spread out over those eight or nine lots and so that would really kind of take the honest off all of us to sort of meet those numbers because that would really lower the the fill you would need in the commercial area as well. So just another variable I think that we have to be conscious of as we, we go forward. And are you are you proposing to build the residential side in phases eventually is or was this all at all at one shot? 
I have to imagine that when it does get built, it will be in phases, but typically your first phase has to be a big enough chunk to sort of recoup your infrastructure costs and, and all that. So, you know, maybe the first 60% gets built and then, you know, you add on in increments after that. But I, I really couldn't tell you at this point because we, we're not at that stage yet. Um, as far as the <coughs> layout goes, like right here, um, I, I don't really have a whole lot to comment on. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll pass the baton for now. <coughs> I suspect I'll have more questions in a little bit. Fair enough. Thank you. Roger? Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so what you're saying is you really don't know whether you're going to have 10 presidential buildings or not. It could be less. Yeah, it, it, could, be, who, who comes it could be smaller buildings with, you know, eight eight unit apartment buildings, you know, laid out in a more campus style, or or or, or that basically everything you see here is maximum maximum building size, maximum st structure height. It was it was just uh, I I don't know that I feel comfortable going through master plan approval showing you something and then coming in and it's twice as big as as you'd expect. So we sort of reach for the upper limit right at the get-go so you know that. Well, I appreciate that, but our dilemma is trying to speculate what's going to happen on the commercial side. And it would seem to me that, I mean, I think the concept is, is really terrific. Um, and, um, but it seems to me that we would be better off trying to deal with this once we know who might be developing the residential side of this project. Uh, I, I agree with you, and, and I think that's really what Jay is, you know, maybe I misunderstand sort of what Jay's memo is getting at, but he, I think, Jay, please step in if I'm wrong, but he's saying that when we do have a layout to come before in site plan, that there's going to be a way, as he said, to sort of code or, or, or add that up by, you know, whether it's deed restrictions or, or just something on the, you have to amend the subdivision plan so that it's part of the record. And that you know going forward that these are the thresholds that we were predicted to hit, you know, and and those may change between now and when we bring in the site plan approval based on or site plan application based on what's proposed to be built. I might just chime in. I I think um, Jason's got it about about right. Where that I think it's important. One of the things that um, <clears throat> I, I meant to sort of mention at the outset and maybe didn't get to quite enough is uh, recognizing that there is a difference between the master plan phase and when they come back for the formal subdivision and site plan phase. I think at this point of master plan, it's, it is, it's really, is the conceptual, as I've already heard, is does the conceptual plan lay out in a, in a manner that's consistent with the overall uh, intent of the ordinance? Are the, um, are the infrastructure components laid out in a manner that won't prohibit future development or potentially impinge upon other developments? Like one of the big elements that we've talked about at, at earlier stages is when the original uh, subdivision was approved, there was a remaining right away that sort of led to the properties um, to the north that we know now are wetlands that can't be um, accessed and that really wasn't a viable uh, future connection, and now you know we're looking at these other uh, another potential future connection um, to the west of the property into what's now Scarborough Downs lands that does seem to lend to a more uh, realistic and reasonable expectation for a connection to Highgis Parkway. So I do think you know at this stage, um, you know get we don't need to get so hyper focused on the exact build out analysis and scenario, but I do think it's worth a discussion. Be sure, you know, have the board uh, provide comments in that regards, but I think we'll really drill into those details and get those administrative checks and balances in place and on the books um, at the next review phase. So we're basically speculating on both the residential side as well as the commercial side at this stage. Well, again, at this stage, you're not approving. <coughs> you're not approving the amount of development. You're, you're not. You know, so you're trying to come up with the 60-40 ratio, right? And we're it, to again, it says, I don't think that needs to be locked in at this point. Okay. It's, it's, you know, 
has the applicant, again, sort of through the site inventory phase being that first part, identifying where the, the good upland buildable lands are and where those natural cultural resources are that we want to protect. Those were sort of identified during the site inventory phase. Now the master plan phase is again laying out the general con uh, layout. So regardless of how big a footprint these buildings are showing, that isn't necessarily what will occur at site plan and subdivision. It's, you know, it, it's just will the general layout be generally consistent with that pattern of development. So what you're what a master plan approval would do at this point is lay out, it would be providing a foundation for where the road networks would go, where structures would be placed, how many units are in those structures, exactly how build, big those buildings are, that would be sort of the detail that gets picked up with the next phase of uh, review, that, and that's that um, site plan subdivision phase. Okay, let me ask you this, Jay, in, in your notes, um, again, dealing with the commercial side. Mm -hmm. I think I read uh, where the town's attorney recommended um, having a provision where, for instance, like um, on lot 2728, any future building would have to be 14,500 square feet. I think... And, it, and you want that to be... I mean, I don't know whether that's... That, that's that the next phase. At this, yep. That's the next phase. That, that would be sort of the next phase. And again, I think there's... A, a bit more nuance in it at that next phase. I don't know that it necessarily has to be lot 28 has to be 14,000 and lot 27 has to be, you know, 23,000. You know, lot, if they came in slightly different, that could be okay. So, so there is more nuance than what's written in here. I was really just trying to get the general cons, again, where we're at master plan, we're at sort of the, the broad umbrella stage of the review. Um, I think that was, that was sort of the, the concept behind what what's well, trying to be articulated. Okay, I guess just to wrap up on my end, I, I, I guess I would agree with everything to, to this point because we see this potential to uh, accomplish everything that has to be done. But again, it's just speculation until we have some firm projects, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'll, I'll Thanks. Now I'll just add quickly, briefly, that um, if I understand it, Beyond that sort of conceptual layout and, and making sure that the infrastructure is, is set up correctly and that the, the groundwork has been laid, so to speak, we also have at least a sense of how of what of what one administrative kind of protocol might look like. And we're not we approve if we grant master plan approval tonight. We're not we're not endorsing or locking ourselves into that particular process. But I think that that legwork that was done at least demonstrates to us that there, you know, there are a couple of different ways that it could be enforced, and I think we'll need to look at that more closely and balance things when we get to the next stage. Um, Rick, do you have anything? I uh, yeah, I actually do, and uh, it's not specific to this project, but it's related to this project. So I think, based on what I've heard from Jay and and when I read, this is just a conceptual overall. We're, we're giving, we're looking at the idea of where they're going and saying it looks okay. But on page four, it says there's potential for 220 to 440 residential units, right? So, you know, if each of the 440 residential units has one child or two child, that's Potentially, if I do the math real quick in my head, that's uh, 880 students. At what point do we look at the number of apartment buildings? Because these are apartments, right? Yeah. These aren't these aren't single family residential dwellings. So, at what point do we evaluate how many residential, how many apartment buildings we've approved in the last? six months and say, we're going to run out of space in the school, or, I mean, we're already, and I'm just looking at this thing, and that's 440 units is a lot. And, and maybe not this, I'll, that's a lot. I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I, my view on it is that that's, that's not really under the planning board's 
purview, at least directly, and that we enforce ordinances and that the ultimately the town, the town council and the and the, the planning professionals craft the ordinances with public input. And certainly, I'm not disputing at all that there's a broader there's some broader issues there, right. but it's not typically something that this board engages in directly. That's not to say that we won't we won't hear some of those concerns and that they're not valid, but it's not really a, a something that's supposed to directly guide our decision making. Right. Right. And again, I don't want this particular applicant to you know, be the camel back, but at some point, I think, I, you know, I have to take another look at the comprehensive plan or something, but it seems like not just our town, <coughs> our towns are doing it as well. I mean, you drive through Westbrook and, and other towns, and there's more and more um, of this, this apartment buildings, which you can put a lot more people in an apartment building than you can put in a single family dwelling in the same area because the single family dwellings require a certain lot size for an apartment building in a complex. So I think at some point um, we really have to look at that. And and the planning board is the we're approving these we're approving these developments. So if it's not us, then I'd like to um, try to figure out who it is. Maybe it's in the comprehensive plan and I have to look at that. But and that's a good opportunity to make a plug for the uh, <laughs> first public kickoff of the comprehensive plan is next Monday night right yeah. in this yeah. chambers at 6.30. So look forward to seeing everyone there. But uh, Tuesday night, thank you. Uh, I've been corrected Tuesday the 23rd. Um, but I, I think your point's taken and I know a number of those type of conversations, that higher level sort of conversation happened at the council level. Um, not too many months ago, there was a joint meeting workshop that the council had on that exact issue, and so those, those conversations certainly are occurring and ongoing. But um, and I, I will say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll okay. turn it back over here in a second. But I, I'll say, as, as someone who also serves on the Long Range Planning Committee, <coughs> that um, that has also had a role in, in some of the some of the modifications to the to the zoning for this in this area and elsewhere that. There has been a lot of deliberation and, and a lot of thought given to some, you know, generally incremental changes to some of these things with with, with those and other concerns in mind. Um, and there have been, you know, the, the council has waited on that and they'll continue to do so. So there are a few different venues for that, um, and we absolutely do end up grappling with that on a sort of a project by project basis. But at sort of a policy level, a policy question, it's something we don't generally get too directly involved with. But I definitely appreciate the concern. Right. Well, I would look, I guess, towards this, whoever you know is is involved in the comprehensive plan to maybe provide direction to the council on, hey, you know, we're getting close to our maximum capacity, and we have to start thinking about what that means. Everybody judges the school, or one of the criteria for judging the school is the size of the classroom. So do you have 20 kids in the classroom, do you have 35? And, and I think that I spend a little bit of time at the high school and the, the classrooms are getting full. So, um, as far as an overall conceptual plan, I think it's fine. I, I would like to, um, as Jay pointed out earlier, to make sure that we don't just build all the residential and then leave the land there hoping that someone moves in commercial. And I, I don't know that's not the intent of the applicant, or, um, but you can't predict what's going to happen. So I think you'd have to phase it in so that we build a certain amount of residential until if that's the direction that we're doing to that area. So. Um, yeah, um, I would. I don't have any problem with conceptual plan. I would like to talk to someone about how many units we allow, not just for this, but for the future. The rest of you. Rachel. Yeah. Um, I've just. I, I don't have a <coughs> problem with the conceptual plan, but I do have 
couple of questions or observations, and that is, uh, I believe there is another exit out onto Route 1 that you planned. Yes, so there's there's two approved exits uh, or entrances to Route 1, actually. Uh, I, actually, that's my question. Is it just an exit or is it both an entrance and an exit because then that stops to stack up the traffic? I believe this is right out, right in only. Is that right? Um, okay. This one down here, right? And that was part of the original approval, traffic movement permit, all that stuff. Um, the question as to when this one gets built, I, I think long range planning and I, I can't I can't promise anything or, or I can't see that far in the future, but you know, it makes a lot of sense to connect in if anything ever happens with the Scarborough Downs parcel. This connection makes a much stronger case for that interconnectivity that, that we all look for. <coughs> I hope that that happens at some point in the future. Um, and as Jake talked about before, you know, we took out the connection up to a three diamonds realty property because of it really was predominantly wet through most of it, but there is a strip of uplands that come in through and would connect back in the Haggis Parkway. So, um, sort of a long answer to a short question. Uh, yeah, it's a right, I believe, 99% sure it's right out, right in. Yeah. I, I did see that it was right out, but I didn't see whether it was one way at that point. Uh, and I might, I, I'd ask you to think about having that one way. The traffic is already kind of tough there and that would be an exit. Uh, the other question that I had, um, you said that the connection is going to ultimately connect to Hagus Parkway, or? Right, that, that would be my expectations. We don't know, you know, we don't control this project, there's no sort of say in, in what happens to that property, but we do have to allow for, for that. So if anything ever happens on Scarborough Downs, I should reword that more. We would that connection would be available for for this project to connect into the Scarborough Downs parcel, which would where, then connect where, and where that could connect to Hagen Park. Okay. Um, the one sort of notion that I had is I started to try and figure out the square footage and of the uh, of the buildings and how that was going to be used, and, and listening to what was said <coughs> about. Um, the need for folks sometimes to build, to expand. Uh, I was wondering, and the possible option might be to use some sort of a, a concept of a, of a bank of square footage. In other words, if you sell off, um, let's say, lot one, and you get 100,000 square feet on lot one, that kind of can be, could that be used as, is it possible to think about it being used as a draw or a bank so that another couple of lots going in, not buildings going in, then you've got the flexibility to be smaller. Uh, and it might take a lot of juggling, but it would, um, it might allow some of the, the flexibility uh, and credit for the larger buildings that do go in. Uh, and then the other thing is, yeah, it, it is going to be difficult to figure out a, a phase in to, so that we're comfortable that we are going to end up with the 60-40. The Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first off, I'm, like I, as I think my fellow board members are, I'm generally pretty comfortable with where we are conceptually in terms of you know, the master plan phase here. Um, as was noted, this site has been vetted quite a bit in the past, and <coughs> there are some changes now, and I think we've, we've highlighted those, and the modifications that have been made are, are definitely appropriate. Um, I share the concern about wanting to make sure that we don't get too far out ahead of ourselves in terms of um, the residential getting way ahead of the commercial, and we're certainly going to have to work together to figure out, to come up with some kind of a mechanism for of enforcing that desired ratio going forward. And I, I'm reminded somewhat of a couple of contract zones that we have in town where we have fairly large scale. It's all residential, but you know there, there are commitments that have been made that were made at the outset um, regarding affordability and maybe some mixed use components. And it's 
it's been a bit of an iterative process with some amendments that have come back in, and it's, it has put a bit of a burden on, on the board and the council, uh, but I think the town collectively has been pretty reasonable and flexible and, and recognizing changing circumstances, but I think we always try to kind of keep our eye on the ball and make sure we're not straying too much from what the underlying commitments are. So, um, you know, it's helpful to hear what Jay had to say about the, that one potential administrative mechanism. I appreciate what the applicant said about some of the maybe unintended, unintended consequences of that and chilling effects that that could have on marketability and things like that. So, um, you know, I hate to feel like we're kicking the can down the road, but we're, we are at a preliminary phase here. And I think everyone is on the same wavelength generally in terms of what the challenges are, but also what the desired kind of overall proportion is. So I'm confident we can work that out um, going forward. And again, to the, to the comment or concern about, you know, kids in the schools and things like that, those are absolutely valid concerns and, um, you know, we'll, we'll certainly have ample opportunity in, in various settings to, to discuss that. Uh, and I know it is something that, that the town does take seriously and are working to really quantify that in as sort of scientific a way as possible, knowing that things do change. So. Um, I think that's about all I had at this point. Uh, Roger, do you have anything else? Just for a point of information, um, so the next time this project will be before us would be either with a developer for the residential side or if somebody wants to develop something commercial. Is that, is that a fair assumption? That uh, sounds like a fair assumption, yeah. Okay. Nick, did you want a, another bite of this? Um, <clears throat> I was just playing with the numbers, so I think it can wait till the next meeting, but it's Definitely challenging and interesting all at the same time. Um, yep. And I just want to clarify something. What we have here for the lots that are undeveloped as far as the floor area, this is max projection, correct? Yes. And that is helpful to know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, and I don't really have anything else to add. I think we've covered this pretty well. And with that, I'll move to approve Commercial Place LLC's request for a master plan approval for Enterprise Business Park, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 47-1 through 36. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for being flexible and kind of it. You know, agreeing to work it down the line. Look forward to seeing where we go from there. Thanks. <coughs> Item number seven: Rosera Properties LLC requests a subdivision and site plan review for a residential subdivision at 79 Muzzy Road, Assessor's Map R55, Lot 18. Okay. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as just noted, this applicant is before the board for a, it's really sort of a subdivision and site plan review. It's a subdivision in the fact that the applicant is proposing 84 um, residential units within seven buildings. Um, but the predominant sort of review criteria that we'll be applying is our site plan review criteria, but it does require sort of that subdivision process which seeks a, or requires a preliminary review and approval by the board before moving to a final review and ultimately approval um, should they meet all the standards. Um, just by way of background, this applicant was before you back in December of 2016 for a sketch plan review. Board members may recall the property is in a couple of different zones. It's in the TVC3. There's a small section of VR2, Village Residential 2. It's also in our Aquifer Protection Overlay District. Um, subsequent to the sketch plan review, the applicant submitted to the town for a pre-application review, which is a formal review process that's fully vetted by staff and peer reviewers, civil engineer, um, the town engineer, town planner, and traffic reviewers. We provided a, a host of comments. 
the applicant resubmitted um, with some responses to those comments back um, a few months ago. But there were some issues with that application, so we um, didn't put that on the agenda, but we actually did another full round of staff and peer reviewer. Um, so this has been pretty well vetted by staff, um, and so you'll note that we don't have, a, you know, our comments are a lot shorter than they might typically be for a project of this size for the first time come before the board, but that's, again, um, <coughs> due in part to the process we've been through. So at this point, just a couple of things I'll highlight and then uh, certainly turn it back uh, to you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of things, that, so as I noted, they're seeking 84 units um, through seven buildings. The applicant is seeking, as part of the uh, uh, allowances within the underlying zoning or the, with the zoning, uh, to take advantage of some of the uh, density provisions within our ordinance. Um, so they're actually seeking 10, uh, 10 uh, additional units over and above the standard density um, by taking advantage of both the transfer development rights provision and, and seeking particularly an in-lieu uh, fee payment as well as uh, the affordable uh, housing component uh, uh, allowance. So a couple of interesting items there. Um, other sort of, in addition to the on-site development, it should be noted that there's quite a bit of off-site development in terms of uh, what is occurring along Muzzy Road, the applicant proposing a left-hand turn lane along Muzzy Road, as well as a uh, significant uh, pedestrian connection to the Gallery Boulevard, which currently has a full uh, sidewalk and, and transit stops as well. Um, and and so those, we're still looking through some of those details, but again, I think um, we're generally happy. Um, third item I just note in our, our town engineer, these are really um, thoughts that we had in terms of the stormwater controls and really looking at uh, the design and trying to maintain as, as much of a buff buffer from the on-site stream as feasible, understanding that there are some development constraints, but trying to look at at least modest um, uh, alternative designs in that measure, and, and uh, Angela may have more to comment on that as we go along. I guess the final thing I would just address at this point is uh, the other significant component on the site is, is that there are a number of buildings and the architectural review, and the applicants done a nice job of providing sort of four side representation of the buildings. Um, so just be sure the board is sort of looking at that and those details. Again, we have a few other staff comments embedded here in our um, in our memo, as well as you should receive a memo from Warder and Kern and Goral Palmer, who is looking at the traffic issues. That, um, I don't know if Angela wants to chime in now, or I guess since I said it, why not, right? Why not? <laughs> Um, I just wanted to point out in staff comments that we talk about, um, I did bring up the, the outfalls are within the 75 foot setback. I know I've talked to Tony about this a little bit, that um, I know that is permittable through DEP, and I understand that, but I know the board has also focused on enhancing buffers and other watersheds. I know we focus primarily on our urban impaired streams, but they weren't all in urban impaired <laughs> before you know, a lot of development came in. So it's also, it's just a good opportunity, I think, for the board to consciously look at that and saying, okay, it makes sense for this development due to um, cost or, you know, restraints on the elevation. So I think there's an opportunity, I think, to revisit some of the design of the BMPs to say, if we lift those up, can you pull some of the outfall away from the stream and enhance that buffer? And that is just an exercise that I think even if we can't get to the 75 foot, maybe there's something that we can do to help that buffer. Um, and, and maybe there isn't, but I don't think that's been investigated, I guess, at this point. So I, I think there's, there might be an opportunity at least to, to take a look at it be worth the board to chime in on, on their thoughts. Okay. Thanks. And with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tony Pantheoko, Southeast Civil Solutions. Here on behalf of Respera Properties, um, I think Jay gave you a, quite an overview. I'll, I'll touch on a couple of things here and then maybe we'll get right into some questions. Um, properties located at 79 Mussey Road, 11.67 acre parcel. As some of you might be aware, the majority of the parcel was, was rezoned to TVC3 
a while back. Uh, since then, the applicant has uh, portioned a separate property under contract, which is this area here. Um, portion of that is in the VR2 zone. Site is, uh, majority of the site, there's a um, field meadow that kind of runs the center of the site. Um, it's wooded on both the east and west sides. On the east side is a stream that runs uh, the length of the property. It's kind of fed, it's fed by the culvert that crosses Mosey Road. Right here, right there. Uh, large wetland areas mapped on the site. Um, you can see that area in green is wetlands. Uh, DEP did go back out there with Mark Hampton to reassess a uh, portion of, of the site to confirm the wetlands. As previously mentioned, um, seven buildings, 84 units, 12 <coughs> units per building, um, half one bedroom, half two bedroom. We've got approximately 890 feet of, of roadway with 147 parking spaces. Uh, the intent is right now is for this to be maintained as private. In terms of utilities, we've got public water and sewer. Uh, we did receive approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District for the flows. Uh, we don't have that letter yet, but that will be um, in the next submission. We've, been, we've met with Portland Water District to discuss uh, service for the site, and we're, we're working our way through that. Underground electric and gas will also serve the building. Each building has a, a utility room. Uh, right in the center here, that face the street for ease of access for connecting the utilities as we come up the road with them. Uh, in terms of DEP, we're going to create approximately 2.78 acres of new impervious area with a disturbance of about 4.5 acres of land, 8,849 square feet of wetland impacts, basically along the edge of the road here where we infringe a little bit right here in this parking lot. That will require, um, in terms of permitting, stormwater permit, tier one wetland impact um, permit and a permit by rule for the pond outlets, uh, as Angela had mentioned. We did receive um, some feedback from DEP. They did approve the permit by rule for the uh, pond outlets, and I forwarded that along this morning. I don't know if anyone's actually seen it, but it did get forwarded along, and we can discuss that outfall uh, a little bit more. Um, also, the project will require a, a left turn lane uh, coming this way on Mossy Road, as well as a, a driveway entrance permit. And we, we met with staff and DOT, and we're still working through some of the design issues for that, so we'll continue to keep people involved and work through it. Um, essentially, that, that's kind of an overview of where we're at. I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions, or uh, if you want to go through a few comments whatever the board that seems appropriate. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have the opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here who'd like to come up and give their name and address, come on up to the podium. I am Cheryl Curry and I'm in the butter. <laughs> I, I'm at 91 Mussey Road. <coughs> and uh, when I heard this first talked about, I think the Scarborough Baptist Church, one night they came over and talked to the <coughs> people in the neighborhood, uh, I made a couple of comments. First of all, I'm not an architect, so I don't always understand all of the terminology, but I'd like to know what a pond outlet is. Uh, we'll... we'll Take note of, of your questions okay. and comments, and then we'll make sure uh, that it gets that, that they all get that's addressed. Stormwater ponds, is that what that means? Yes. Okay. Well, what I'm mostly concerned about is my the property that I have here is private property that I'm trying to keep as wildlife sanctuary. And the thing that concerns me most is that if you have a lot of apartments here, uh, you know, I've had problems with people on the Holman Road because they think my food lot is a great place to dump stuff. They think it's a great place to, to empty their swimming pools. They think it's a great place to, to walk their dogs. And I'm trying to keep wildlife refuge here. And so my, my request is, and I did mention it to them, and I don't see it on here, that there be some kind of a fence 
uh, along my property line to keep people from using my property as their backyard. That's all I'm really concerned about. I'm trying to keep it as undeveloped and as safe for wildlife as I can. And people seem to think that if there are woods in their backyard, that they can use whatever they want. People camp there. Uh, I've had to deal with that, you know. So I, uh, that's my concern. I would like to see some fencing here and here so that people will realize that that's private property and it's not for their use. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I will note that we, uh, everyone on the board should have received a copy of, of a, an email from Scott White of 5 Honan Road, um, raising some concerns about uh, water infiltration and how this project might potentially uh, affect that. I think everyone should have that. That'll be entered into the record as well. Um, with that, right. sure. Where is 5 Honan Road? I'm looking at your buttons. 500 Valley Road is, is the second house uh, down on the right. Oh, way over there. Okay. So it's, well, it's not showing yet, but roughly in that area. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, let's start down at this end this time. Rachel, do you have anything in this? Um, I have a couple of observations, and that, that's. Um, one of the things when you came be, when this project came before us before I had asked for something that um, would allow our folks uh, would allow the people there a uh, place to gather and I I do note that uh, a couple of gathering areas have been put in there uh, to create community and I, I think I thank you for following through with that um, I also note that it is pet friendly and you're proposing a dog park. Yes, uh, there's a fenced-in area right down in here. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, and I appreciate that, too, and I'm sure the, the tenants will as well. Uh, I do have a question on the, the building designs that you thoughtfully provided us with. And um, my question is, I'm going to have different uh, colors to the, the houses or the apartment buildings, or are they all going to be the same? I'll defer that to her. One of the things I, I don't want, frankly, is, is a march of large buildings that kind of all look the same. So. Good evening. Uh, Rocky Risperra. Um, our intention actually was to, to have the buildings all the same color. Um, we've got, uh, our architect has worked with us on some colors, and um, my brother and I feel quite strongly that it looks better to have the buildings one color. We actually have a project uh, in Westbrook going right now that um, we had some input from the planning board. They felt that it did not look better and wanted two different colors, and so we're doing that. So I'm not saying that, uh, no, we won't do that, uh, but at this point in time, our plans are to move forward with, with one color combination. Um, Jay's actually put some renderings up, up on the board, and that's, it's, a, it's sort of a sage green with over a, uh, a sterling gray color. And um, we feel that it breaks the, the scale of the building up and, and uh, should look very nice. Um, we would like to keep it uniform, but I would obviously uh, be willing to work with the board on that. All right, I appreciate that. I, and I hope you will, from my perspective, I would like to see that. Thank you. Also, thanks. Uh, sure. Um, I think I'm going to leave the. Uh, the discussion of the fence to the chair. Um, overall, I think the, the concept and the um, buildings look good. Um, maybe, Jay, can you explain to me the extra 10 units and how that works? Sure. Um, <coughs> this is a very easy site, right, Rocky? <laughs> I read it, but I guess yeah. no. We we, we had to work through the net residential density a few times. Um, so, broad brush, you know, the 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 way you start a project is you come up with your net residential calculation. Start with your your growth lot, and then there's certain things you have to subtract out. You take that 
net area, that net residential area, multiply that by the base number of allowed units per lot, uh, per acre, I'm sorry, which I believe in this area is five. So in that, and I don't have the numbers directly ahead in front of me, but that got the project to roughly 32 units, I'll say. And then um, th uh, probably 34 units, 38. 38 units, all right. Um, so that was their ba base net residential density. Then the ordinance goes on to allow for density bonuses. And there's two ways you can take advantage of density bonuses, and the applicant is combining the two, which again is also permissible. One is by uh, doing what we call our development uh, transfer program, and either you buy additional density by preserving lands in sort of the low growth areas of town, roughly west of the turnpike, or you pay an in lieu fee of $20,000 per unit that goes to a dedicated fund for land conservation purposes. The applicant has chosen to take advantage of the in lieu fee component, so to, to purchase to get five additional uh, units. So they'll be paying $100,000, presuming the board approves this concept, $100,000 to that dedicated fund. Then the applicant identified they wanted to get five more potential units. So they took advantage of the other provision around affordable housing. What that allows is one additional unit per acre, um, provided that at least 40% of those units are affordable. So of the five additional units they're now getting uh, f through the affordable uh, provision, Three are allowed to be market rate. Two need to be maintained as uh, affordable units. And our housing alliance has developed sort of a, uh, uh, the principles around how those would be maintained and sort of um, administered by the town and reported to the town on an annual basis. And there's some fine tuning that needs to be worked out between now and potential uh, uh, final approvals, but, but the general parameters are in place for that. So the base 38, uh, the base 38 units they got, plus the 10 additional, brought it up to 48 units. Then, through the magic of Section 7 of our ordinance, I think 7F if I'm remembering right, allows for different unit sizes and types to be counted as fractional units. So if you have one bedroom that's 750 feet, square foot feet or less, that counts only as a half a bedroom, half a unit, I'm sorry. And if you have a unit that's two bedrooms and less than 1,200 square feet, that counts as two-thirds of a unit. So what the applicant has done is said of their 48 whole units, they're crafting half of those units are going to be one bedroom. So that's and then, and then the other half are going to be these two-third units, and that math brings you up to 84 total units. Um, so it's slightly uh, nuanced, to say the least. Work. Well, <coughs> so I hope that answered your question. It did very <laughs> thoroughly. Uh, I don't feel bad. I didn't understand it the yeah. first time I read it now. And I'm thoroughly impressed <laughs> that you got through all that. Um, that was pretty, pretty good. Um, Okay, so the density is fine. Um, how does, I guess, with all those calculations and everything, I'm, I'm fine with the density. I'm, I'm impressed that you did all the math to get it right. Um, how does that work for the school impact fees? Sorry. Yeah, no. Nope, I'm not going to school council nope, yet, but nope, you know, this was how a, does uh, that work with the school <laughs> impact fee? Each unit is required to pay a school impact fee. Um, Whether it's one so bedroom or two bedroom. Correct. There, there are, um, for multi-families, there are, so a single family, uh, I'm not gonna, I can't remember exactly what the numbers are, but there are, is a formula and it yeah. is fractional. Again, I bet he knows it. Based on the, I can get you close, but um, I don't. Single family? Yeah. 4,380. Okay, so single family is 4,385. And so based on if you're doing a half a unit, I can't remember if it's quite half, but there, there is, every unit pays towards the school impact fee. And part of that consideration, you know, to the to the um, to your broader point, um, 
one of the things that, as we had talked about before, that when the council had held the workshop and the long range planning committee sort of looked at this, a lot of the discussion has been around sort of both local and national trends in terms of the type of, um, uh, or I should say, the number of children that you see based on unit types. So I think, you know, we, we've been provided numbers for other similar projects here in Scarborough. When I say local, I mean very local. Um, other existing apartment complexes and what their, you know, sort of ratio of children per unit is. And, and so um, there has been a pretty, some pretty okay. significant thought into that. But. All right. So that's all figured into the, the impact fees, the densities, impact fees reflected mm -hmm. by the density. density correct. Density. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, other than that, I think it looks good. Roger? Uh, Rocky, why? I'm kind of curious. How do you feel about Mrs. Uh, Ms. Curry's dilemma? Well, I'd be happy to address that. Uh, and, and she and I did speak. Uh, we had a public informational meeting at the church when we first started this whole, whole process, and, and uh, concern for other people accessing her land was expressed, and, and I completely understand that. Um, in, in doing the layout uh, of the project and coming up with where the buildings were going to sit and where the ponds were going to be, I didn't feel like there was a big area where someone would feel like they wanted to access her land because the, the best place to do it is right where we're doing our dog park. Uh, we'd be happy to look at that a little closer in the field to see if some more, you know, maybe some fencing, some additional fencing is needed. Uh, but down in the corner where somebody might want to access you know, we're going to have one of our drainage ponds there, and it's not, I'm not saying somebody wouldn't go there, but it's just not all that inviting, I wouldn't think. Um, and so, as I've said, I'd, I'd be happy to, to take a little closer look in the field and, and see if some fencing is needed. But uh, we, we do have pretty good control where we manage our own units, and, and we're pretty selective um, with that whole process. Um, we do recognize that you know that people want to have pets, and and so we've been part of our success in other towns is being pet friendly. But we we know we have to provide adequate space for that to happen, and so we've tried to do that with this. Uh, okay, uh, that small parcel at the top there on the right. What? Why did you buy that? That little. <laughs> so what we bought. The other one. Sure, that one. At all. I think you're talking about this piece? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we, we, we're buying, I don't own it yet, but we're buying this house on Honan Road, which came with this little tail section of land. And that's going to allow us to put some of our stormwater management right in here. So if you look on some of the other sheets that you have, there's a, there's a drainage pond that goes right here. Right here. Yeah. Another drainage pond that goes here. That's pond three, right? Uh, I don't know the pond numbers off okay. the top. So does that answer your question? That's why we, we bought this piece so that we can pick up some area for stormwater management. Okay. So you're, you're, you're looking to buy that uh, piece of property that is a two-story dwelling with a pool in the backyard? Correct. So we're going to, this really isn't going to become part of the project that we'll just, you know, we'll probably sell that eventually. Uh, it's a single family <coughs> home. It's a very nice home on a, on a nice lot. We're just taking some of this excess land that was with this lot and putting it into this project. Okay. And uh, I guess I, I just need a clarification, Jay, on reading your notes about this, uh, the snow plowing at the end of Honan Road. You made a comment about the 10 foot, you, you purchased uh, this 10 feet of space there. I think I'll let our town engineer <laughs> take this one. <laughs> that might have been my comment. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to point out now's the time to talk about where Public Works is going to plow at the end of Honan. And I appreciate the fact that we're we're talking about it now and that we're given actually some more right away and, and making that truly part of the town right away. I just want to make everybody aware that obviously when you push off the end of that, we have very little room to the right of way. So in reality, Public Works with a big wheeler is going to push over that property line. And so 
I was I was asking is now the time to look at putting an easement so that we don't have to go in there and pull that out. Um, just what's realistic and for an operational standpoint. That's what. Can I address that? Mm -hmm. So what Angela was talking about is right now Honan Road ends right here at this line. This section with the back around, the town has an easement for that. They don't actually own that land right now. So we identified that early on in, in conversations with staff and said that, yes, you know, the town could own this, and it, and it makes sense the town, for the town to own that. Well, when we went out and did the survey and figured out what really got built, you can see the pavement's very close to the end of the town's existing right-of-way. So what Angela's talking about, I think, is, is maybe we just give a little more easement area um, the, the town's been plowing this for quite some time and, and there's adequate room to put the snow, but the snow winds up on this property. And so I think we can just put an easement area on the plan and so the town would have a right to right. put the snow and, there. And, right now and I don't think it really is going to hurt anything. I think it may mean that we, we need to wiggle the sidewalk a little bit, just, just kind of pull it over a little, give the town a little more room. The stack snow in there, but I, I think it's working now, and I think it can continue. Right. And I guess that's what I wanted to put out. The difference is, right now, that's not developed in there. So now, all of a sudden, when we're pushing, you know, a six or ten foot snow bank onto what is now, you're showing its proposed sidewalk. Sidewalk. That's going to mean an issue. I would say the town shouldn't be doing that, and that we would have to come in and, and address that. And so I just thought, let's talk about it up front, and if there's an easier way to do that, deal with that. So I think that's easily you know, answered on the next plan submission. Okay. We can we can just make those adjustments. Thanks. Okay. The last question is um, on that stretch of Muzzy Road. Is, <coughs> are the utilities right now like sewer and water and everything going down to where you're going to be putting in your entrance? Yes, they are. Okay. So I don't quite understand where the is there a water problem with Mr. White's property because of the gallery development? Is, so in terms of Mr. White's uh, concern has to do with drainage and, and stormwater um, issues, and so uh, again, I think I'll turn to our town engineer who has some more experience in that realm. Um, I, I guess as far as Mr. White's concerns, I, I did talk with him on the phone as well, he called, um, and talked a little bit about a lot of, I think his issues, has been a lot of change upstream of him. So, which I will say how this site specifically drains is downstream of him. Um, so not to discount his issues, because I think he has seen a lot of change, but I think it's a lot of change upstream. Um, which is the gallery, right? Right, and, and, and those along Muzzy Road, yeah. like Asian Fusion and other ones before to see more recently. And um, I know with this, this is, uh, we talked early on about minimizing impacts to the wetland. Wetland is one of those things that obviously kind of works as a sponge or a detention area itself. So we, we start encroaching in that. One part of the concern is what happens um, to that water gets pushed up, let's say, onto the Honing Road backyard. And so I think what one of the comments early on was about there is some um, culverts that have been installed to address some of the overflow that might have to be released out of that wetland area. So I think um, NCS has done a good job of accounting for that, I guess. And and I think staff is looking at it in those in that lens, I guess, to say how would that impact the neighbors. And I think between the back and forth we've done during the, um, the early stages, like that planning board hasn't seen, I think we've kind of I've gotten to that point where we're we're looking at those things and, and dealing with those and the design. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for Nick? <coughs> you know, bring us back to that sidewalk for a quick second. Is is that a town request to have that there or was that a kind of an idea to try to somewhat but connect hone into this this neighborhood? I think I'll take credit for it. I, I thought it would be a good thing to have because uh, someone could could access that neighborhood and probably make their way down a corner store or something if they wanted to. Um, it just felt like you know it would be a good idea to have pedestrian access. You know, one of the things that came out of out of our initial meeting with the neighbors were they did not want to see Honan Road extended. They didn't want to see our project as accessed by Honan Road with vehicular access. So 
Uh, but I think the you know the idea of pedestrian access makes sense to a lot of people, and and that's why I I put it on the plan. And you know now that I look at it really closely, it's not quite in the right place, but I think it could it could move, and then it would give somebody access to you know, want to walk their dog or take a walk. It's yeah, I think that's probably actually where my concern stems is now. Are you kind of helping traffic flow onto Honan Road where they expressed that they weren't so keen on traffic flow, whether it's vehicular or personnel? I worry because most people walk in the straightest line, the shortest distance possible, and with the gallery shops not terribly far away, I can see a clear cut cut through here to you know through somebody's yard, somebody thinking that they're gonna you know save some time and. Take the take the shorter yeah. route, but I, if it's you know if it was me, if it's not necessary, it's not something requiring the connectivity. Don't do it. I mean, and we're gonna have a problem with the plowing. You know, somebody's gonna have to clear the sidewalk where the snow is gonna sit, right? You can't can't leave it locked. So, I mean, my question is why you can have it. Um, but I guess my 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 comment was not about eliminating the sidewalk. I just want to make clear with that because there is no sidewalk from their entrance to Honan, so there is no. I mean, it's not probably a safe walk to, for those residents on Honan to go along Muzzy to get to the sidewalk, where this might be an opportunity. And I think our standards do typically seek to make those pedestrian connections where feasible. And I think one of the things that we've worked on in this project, and I, you know, maybe I didn't articulate at the outset, is the applicant is providing for a sidewalk connection from their entrance um, down to Gallery, uh, uh, to Boulevard Drive, uh, the intersection where you get, go up into Walmart and, and Lowe's and those sites where there along is a Muzzy road, road, right? Along Muzzy Road, um, but they aren't, so sort of the connection through to Honan Road is in lieu of sort of developing a sidewalk along what's shown as sort of the wetland area, if you will, or the non-developed area of their parcel um, enables sort of that connection through so their site. On the wet, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, this plan, so that is not a sidewalk on? Correct. There's no sidewalk from from the intersect from their okay. drive down towards Honan Road. Now I understand. Thank you. Yep. All right. Makes more sense now, Rocky. Good job. <laughs> um, and then my final comment is uh, on your colors. Uh, I, I'm fine with a single continuous kind of feel to the neighborhood. Um, I guess my follow-up question to that would be, if they ever wanted to go back and paint them, would, would they come in front of us and ask us permission to repaint the building? So, uh, so what, uh, this is, my question is this. Why are we delving in? I mean, I can see as a standard and design, and we want it to look nice. I get that. But if he ever wanted to change the paint color of his own, we're not expecting him to come back and ask for permission, are we? Well, the design standards talk about the board approving the architecture, the siding, the materials, the colors. Um, so ultimately, I guess that would be, if the board doesn't feel that that would be necessary, then that could be stipulated and stated. Um, but that is what the design standards, that is. What's we'll the see you in charges. 15 years when that paint starts to flake, right? Uh, it's actually vinyl side. Vinyl side. <laughs> vinyl is final, right? Um, I'm okay. I want a chromatic look to it. That's, that's of course, the personal think, preference. You know, we also have our administrative review process where we try to expedite certain elements like that. Uh, we work through the chair. So, just play your cards right on the chair. You can. <laughs> <laughs> I can honor it. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm good. That's, it's fine. It looks like a, a good project. I hope you can work something out with the abutter um, regarding uh, the concerns uh, about the private property. And, um, that's it. Good luck. Thanks. Rocky, could you uh, refresh my memory on what the <coughs> comment was? It was the very beginning of the presentation. I think. I'm not sure I totally followed it at the time. The response to the um, stormwater outfall? Yes, I Sorry. think she asked about what what it was that we were talking about with stormwater outfall. Well, going back even further than that, um, your engineer, uh, I think, made brief reference to, I think, a, a recent change that was made that we may not have seen, or maybe I didn't follow that correctly. I'm not, I'm not following you. Um, what I thought I heard, and maybe I, mis maybe I misunderstood, but what I thought I heard was some reference to a, to a, a response to the, the concern or the, or the suggestion that the outfalls be 
pull that oh, sure. away okay. from that. I understand what, right. what you're talking about now. Okay. So I think Angela wanted us to look a little more closely to see if we could pull some of those outfalls back right. out of the 75-foot setback. And uh, what Tony was pointing out is that we've already gone to the DEP and got it approved as it's designed. So we need to look at it. Obviously, we need to want to work with Angela and, and try to come up with ways uh, to minimize the impact on that. Uh, but what I think we proposed, you know, should be should be acceptable. It's certainly, it's acceptable to the state. I would hope it would be acceptable to the town. But we certainly will take a look. Uh, you know, we're going to be meeting with Angela, so we'll take a look at what we could do to to try to minimize that. One of the things you know, it's very difficult with stormwater management now uh, to, to, to work with um, work with all your grades and, and we're trying to minimize uh, fill impacts, we're trying to minimize wetland impacts. We are hemmed in uh, you know, pretty heavily on the site with wetland on one side and stream on the other. But uh, we certainly, will, Tony's going to take a look at it and we'll, we'll chat with Angela and see if we can come up with a little, a little something that could make it better. All right. Thanks, I appreciate that and appreciate the clarification. Well, uh, so just going through the themes and the notes here, uh, and I think you're you're in pretty good shape here overall. I appreciate the willingness to uh, work with the town on an easement for the, the snow storage area, um, willingness to work with you better on keeping people off the property. I, I would think that, uh, at least in, you know based on my own experience and probably yours as well, that just the the mere fact that you well, the site will be fully developed and there will be people living there to be actively managed, as I think you suggested, that itself should serve to discourage some of the trespassing or loitering that might otherwise go on because it's very clearly, visibly private property. Uh, but I think things like, you know, people dumping leaves and that sort of thing, right. that, that's all going to be taken care of by us and, and, you know, those kinds of infringements are certainly easily handled. Um, in terms of the architecture, I'm, I'm fine with the colors and, and it's really not, as you pointed out, it's really not monochromatic. It's, you've got sort of that two-tone with the sage on the top, which I, you know, again, not that we want to micromanage this, but I happen to think that's a, a good look and I think it is consistent with our design standards. Um, related to that uh, and also connected to the design standards. Staff did have a comment about the utility rooms which face the, the parking mm -hmm. areas. I don't know if you so, could give some, a okay. little more consideration. I'm, I'm not thinking about anything exotic, but maybe just a little bit more architectural detail on the doors or something like that. I'd like to touch on that if uh, Jay's flipping through pictures here, but keep going. I'll let you know when you find it. All right. <laughs> there it is. Oh. Okay. So that's a picture of a very similar building that we built over in Westbrook. And that's the side that I would envision most people would find most offensive. Um, it's the side with our, uh, with our boiler room. And what we've done with this updated plan on this particular side of the building is, I don't know if my, you can see where there are HVAC units here. There's electrical meters. Mm -hmm. this, this has a shed roof design here. We've changed it. Jay, if you can change now to keep going, should be there. So we've extended our, we've gone to a flat roof, which our architect has, <coughs> has feels it looks a lot better than the shed roof. It has a little, little uh, railing on the top and kind of blends in with the rest of the railing system there. We've extended the uh, room out. And these two doors right on the very end, that's going to house all of those meters. All those electric meters will be behind there. I think one of the staff comments was, you know, that these doors shouldn't just be a flat plain old door, and that's, that's sort of what's drawn, but it's certainly, you know, I would use an embossed you know, mm -hmm. door uh, there to make it, make it look better. Next to, the, next to that, you can see some lattice work here on two sides, and that's designed uh, to shield those HVAC units that go on the side of the building. And so then Keith Smith, uh, our uh, landscape architect, uh, Keith is here tonight, could answer questions if you have any, um, has designed a pretty elaborate um, landscaping package for this uh, this neighborhood and uh, so we really feel like we greatly improved the way that looks and, and should should really be acceptable uh, okay. 
I appreciate that. Okay. Hopefully Ms. Augusts will be here for the, for the landscape. I was disappointed to see she wasn't here. I got Keith here and everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, thank you for that. All right. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not leaving any uh, any loose ends here. Now, I think that pretty well covers it between my comments, questions, and those that others had. Um, again, as you alluded to, you've got a DEP permit in. Uh, so right now, what we'd be considering is preliminary subdivision approval. Um, unless others have other additional comments or questions, um, I'm going to motion forward, simple motion forward to that effect. Uh, I'll move uh, to approve Resbera Properties LLC's request for a preliminary subdivision and site plan approval for residential subdivision at 79 Muzzy Road, Assessor's Map, R55, Lot 18. Second. Okay, second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. We have a staff report. Uh, yeah, I have two items to report on. One I've already touched on once, but I'll want to be sure I echo. Um, we are beginning the comprehensive planning process. This is going to be a year and a half or two year um, plan, uh, planning process culminating in a plan for the future of the community. Um, the first public kickoff is next Tuesday, the 23rd at 6.30 right here in chambers, so hopefully people are able to join us and start the conversation. This is really, as I said, this is the start of our conversation. Uh, throughout the summer months, going into the fall, there'll be many more opportunities for discussion. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited about this. The Long Range Planning Committee has been doing a lot of work gearing up for this activity. Um, and so we hope uh, everyone here on the planning board and those at home are able to join us. Um, the other thing I just want to make mention of, another project that um, our department has been working on and is culminating in a public meeting, um, is the Higgins Beach form based uh, character code. Um, one of the uh, um, commitments that the community made when we adopted that zoning was to do an audit of the zoning. Um, and so the zoning's been in place about a year and a half. We've been through a couple of building cycles. Um, and so we, on are going through, as I said, an audit process. And so, again, working through the Long Range Planning Committee and the neighborhood in Higgins Beach, um, there'll be a public meeting on June 11th. That's actually a Sunday. It's 10 to 1. It's really an open house, an opportunity for people to come in. Um, there isn't going to be sort of a formal presentation as part of this. It's just a, an opportunity, as I said, for folks in the neighborhood to come in, express their um, likes, dislikes, what's worked, maybe things that could use some tweaking uh, moving forward um, so we can really uh, continue to refine that um, that code. So. Where is that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, uh, that will be at the um, at the Associations Clubhouse, the okay. Higgins Beach Associations Clubhouse, right down there. Thank you for bringing that up, the location. So um, those are two items I had. Uh, Angela, do you have anything you want to? Thank you. Uh, is there an administrative amendment report? Uh, yep, I have one item to report on the uh, Holy Donut site, former Tim Hortons. They are adding a shed sort of in the back corner, back behind their dumpsters. Um, so we're in the process of working through the finer details, but um, ultimately that has received administrative approval. What are they going to put in the parking garage? <laughs> Step by step. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any planning board correspondence beyond the email that was referenced earlier? No? Okay. Any planning board comments? Uh, we had a transportation committee meeting. And just three things that I think might be of interest is um, one, we talked about upgrading and synchronizing the signals on uh, Route 1. Supposedly, if you catch it right, you can drive right through without having to stop. Um, there was also... Has that ever been done? Has that ever been done? Well, it's, it's a secret. We're not going to let it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was another interesting discussion about the crosswalk, um, the signals to various crosswalks, in particular along Route 114 and 
and you can have you can't have too many because if you have too many, then they get ignored. Or <coughs> so it's you know you have to have a certain number so they become meaningful to people. And uh, the last uh, thing I'll mention is um, we had a discussion about <coughs> the roads, and um, it's interesting because we have we have too many roads in Scarborough that do not meet um, um, main DOP. Um, DOT standards, and because they don't meet the standards, we can't take uh, advantage of their funding for repaving. So, you know, uh, you know, we're missing, they don't have adequate shoulders or a variety of different criteria, but we just have a lot of, we have probably more roads in Scarborough as a percentage than some of our surrounding communities, and because of that, we can't, uh, they don't meet those standards, we can't take advantage of state funding for repaving. So I thought that was kind of an interesting point. Hmm. I don't have a fourth. Huh? Back to us when you have a solution. <laughs> <laughs> We're working like on the solution. Sounds like a bit of a catch-22 to me. <laughs> interesting. Thank you. Um, I have a question for staff, uh, and it's uh, relevant to one of the uh, items that we had this evening. Um, can you update us on what's happening with the Asian Fusion site? and the, the cutting that took place there and the setback issue there? Sure. Um, I, I think as I've previously indicated, staff has issued a, a notice of violation for the property, as has DEP. Um, one of the sort of uh, uh, time frame items that needs to be most addressed um, moving forward is the replanting along the stream. Um, so we have received a copy of a revegetation plan um, and the expectation is that that um, again per per the um, uh, per the violation letters that are out there is that the vegetation needs to be done by June 30th. But in discussions, I think we're going to be meeting out there on site pretty soon with the landscaper. Um, I do just want to note that I did mention that that's what needs to be done moving forward. What we've been doing in the meantime is having a uh, continue to have the site inspected to be sure that. The, the the stream bank is stabilized, um, and you know we aren't having any erosion uh, mm -hmm. following the stream, and that whatever is is being picked up by some stone check dams, and, and other appropriate measures are are occurring out there. Um, I should note the expectation is based on the conversations I've had. The applicant um, they want to come back to this board for a sketch plan review, um, so I think we'll see that at our next meeting. Um, if it's not the next meeting, I would envision then the other, our next meeting in June, but um, they are gearing up to come back before the board and then re-engage the site plan review process. One of the issues that was identified, and again, I, I, um, I may have mentioned this previously, but um, in, now that they've gone back to the site, there's identified that the, the extent of the stream on the property wasn't uh, picked up quite accurately and correctly on the first round of plans that were approved by the board. So we're having them restart the site plan review process, um, depicting the, the full extent of the stream and really um, going through that whole process. Okay. All right, that was an approval that was that was done before some who are currently on the board and joined the board. So it'd be a good opportunity to get reacquainted with mm -hmm. them, especially with what's happened there recently. All right. Thank you. Any other planning board comments or questions? All right. I guess we've cut into the Celtics ratings enough. <laughs> so with that, I'll uh, move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Thank you.